Welcome to the second part of uh, this series of doctrinal lectures, or really the third part, because the, the first part was split in two. Uh, now this one will be on the Holy Trinity, or on God. We, uh, last in the last uh, lecture, talked a bit about also this how we can talk about God, uh, and that uh, when we talk about God, it's really analogical talk about God. We cannot fully express uh, the truths about God in uh, in our language, but what we can say uh, is related to to truth. So it's not untrue, but it's we, it's also not the full truth that we can express in uh, in human language. Uh, and that's important for when we talk about God. Now we are going to talk about the Trinity and the challenge uh, that we face when talking about the Trinity is uh, that some claim that uh, the doctrine of the Trinity is a later development that it was made up at the Council of Nicaea. Uh, and some will say that it's not in the Old Testament and therefore the New Testament is wrong. That's what, how the Judaists will uh, Will say it, but uh, but 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 those who claim to be uh, Christians, uh, they will say that it's it was made up later, uh, like the Arians, uh, the ones who were condemned at the Council of Nicaea, uh, and the the Unitari Unitarians and the Jehovah's Witnesses. Uh, they will say that uh, Jesus is not God, or at least he's not uh, he's not the same God as the Father. Uh, and many of them will claim then that the spirit is just an impersonal power. On the other hand, we face a challenge from those called modalists or sabellianists. Uh, they claim that the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are just three different revelations of God and not three persons. When we look at the at the Trinity, it is a progressive revelation that happens of the Trinity. Uh, throughout the Old and New Testament, and it's not fully revealed until the New Testament. But uh, there are, it, it is already present in the Old Testament. Uh, and uh, especially when we look back on texts from, uh, from the first chapters of Scripture, we can see uh, that they are uh, Trinitarian. We might not have been able to just take these texts out of context and then read them Trinitarian, but we can uh, see when we look back at them that uh, that uh, there is there are hints of the Trinity and the plurality plurality in God there. And um, we can see that in uh, in the first chapter of the Bible uh, in Genesis one. There is a plural name for God in Hebrew, Elohim, meaning really gods. Uh, and uh, some have claimed that uh, this is just a plural of majesty, uh, but that's something they have not been able to prove. Also, we can see in uh, Genesis chapter 1, verse 2, that it says, And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. So the Spirit is present. And then later in Scripture, when the Spirit is revealed more and more, we can see that this is the Holy Spirit that was spoken of here. The same way with the Genesis 1-3, when it says, Then God said, God spoke. When the Word is identified later as one of the divine persons in the Trinity, we can look back at this text and see that He is the one speaking the Word. Uh, and especially when we reach uh, John chapter 1, when it says that uh, the, in the beginning was the Word, and uh, everything was created by the Word, uh, and this Word is then uh, described as the Son of God. There's also a hint in, uh, in how uh, creation happened. Um, um, let me quote uh, Robert Lee, I'm here from his book on the Holy Trinity. Uh, he says, on day one, God creates light, while on day four, he makes the moon and the stars. On day two, he separates the waters, making the clouds and the seas and forms the sky, while on day five, he creates birds and fish to live there. On day three, he forms the dry ground, and on day six, he creates animals and humans whose native elements this will be. He shows his sovereign freedom in naming and blessing his creation and sees that it is thoroughly good. 
Uh, so there is a uh, it's it, so the creation happens in two in, in two times three days, uh, and it's and 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 the first day corresponds to the fourth, and the second to the uh, to to the fifth, and and the third to the sixth day. Uh, Robert Lethem he continues this. God, who created the universe, does not work in a monolithic way. His order is varied. It is threefold, but one. His work shows diversity in its unity and unity in its diversity. This God loves all and variety together. This reflects the chapter's record of God himself. The triadic manner of the Earth's formation reflects the nature of its creator. So, uh, creation itself expresses a threeness in God. Now, we want we will not be able to prove this from just uh, Genesis chapter 1. But when we see later that God is triune, we can look back at this and say, well, this is already a hint of God being a triune God, uh, the threefold manner in which he creates uh, the world. Then in uh, Genesis chapter 1 verse 26, it says, Then God said, Let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let us make, he says. So it's it's really a, a plural, plural, plurality that speaks here. Uh, it's more than one person that talks here. And he says, let us make. So the Trinity is speaking with himself. And then he says, in our image. There's one image. Uh, but it is our image. It is the image of uh, this uh, of the Trinity, uh, but it is one image. And later we'll see that this image is the Son of God, Christ. He is the image of, of uh, the essence of God. Uh, then let's jump to Genesis chapter 3, verse 22. Then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us to know good and evil. And now lest he put out uh, his hand and take also of the three of life and eat and live forever. Uh, here again, God talks about us, that man uh, has become like one of us. So he's talking about more than one person in God. We see the same happening in Genesis chapter 11, verse 7. Come, let us go down and there confuse the language that they may not understand one another's speech. Uh, again, God talks to himself uh, and talks to, and, and speaks about himself as more than one person. We see all this in uh, in 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 uh, the in creation and the primeval history of uh, of the world. Now it is as I said, this is a progressive revelation, and we see more and more of the Trinity revealed. Um, and uh, when we reach Abraham, we see we meet uh, someone called the angel of the Lord and the word of the Lord. Um, Genesis chapter 15 verse 1 says, After these things the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision, saying, Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your exceedingly great uh, reward. Uh, so someone appeared here was called the word, something that was seen. Uh, and the word is the one talking here. He's saying something. So the word is a person uh, that is somehow visible so that he can be seen in a vision uh, by Abram. Uh, and uh, when we know uh, John's Gospel, chapter 1, verse 1, we know that who this word is. It is the Son of God who is called the Word of the Lord. But we meet this Word of the Lord throughout the Old Testament. Uh, some have speculated that this was some kind of Greek idea that uh, that John tried to uh, to apply to Christ, but really it is something we see already in the Old Testament, uh, that the Word of the God, uh, the Word of the Lord is, uh, is a person appearing to people. Then the text continues, But Abram said, Lord God, what will you give me, seeing I go childless, and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus? So when uh, Abram, or as he's later called Abraham, meets this word of the Lord who appears in a vision, he sp speaks to him and says, Lord God. He recognizes the divinity of this word who appeared to him. 
Then he brought him outside and said, it says in verse 5, so he is the word here. Uh, the word uh, is there uh, locally and brings Abram outside. And then uh, verse 9, so he said to him, bring me a three-year-old heifer, a three-year-old female goat, a three-year-old ram, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. Then he brought all these to him and cut them in two down the middle and placed each piece opposite the other. Opposite the other, but he did not cut the birds in two. So here the the word again, the word of the Lord speaks to Abram and asks him to bring these to him. So he is present at a specific place uh, where he is visibly present, and so that Abram can go somewhere else and bring these things to him. Now this word of the Lord is the same, and we'll see that. Uh, later, he's the same as the one called the angel of the Lord, and we should remember here that the term angel, we know it, especially from the New Testament, where it's a technical term, and perhaps it became a technical term between the two testaments, uh, and and there's a, it's a technical term for for uh, for the spirits, the created spirits that uh, that serve God, but really the the term angel uh, means messenger. So it's very close to the term word. Both are something that expresses uh, that 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 uh, someone is is giving a message, uh, whether it's the messenger or the word, which is really the message. Um, so those two terms are they they are close to each other in meaning. Now there's this angel of the Lord, who's also uh, revealed as the Lord Himself. We see him in Genesis chapter 16, where he meets Hagar. Uh, now the angel of the Lord found her by a spring of water in the wilderness, by the spring on the way to Shur. And he said, Hagar, Sarai's, Sarai's maid, where have you come from and where are you going? She said, I am fleeing from the presence of my mistress Sarai. The angel of the Lord said to her, Return to your mistress and submit yourself under her hand. Then the angel of the Lord said to her, I will multiply your descendants exceedingly, so that they shall not be counted for multitude. And the angel of the Lord said to her, Behold, you are with child, and you shall be a son. You shall call his name Ishmael, because the Lord has heard your affliction. He shall be a wild man, his hand shall be against every man, and every man's hand against him. And he shall dwell in the presence of all his brethren. Then she called the name of the Lord who spoke to her, You are the God who sees. For she said, Have I also seen him who sees me? So here we have uh, three times this uh, person who appears to Haggai is called the angel of the Lord, meaning the messenger of the Lord. Uh, or really four times here. Uh, and then he says, I will multiply your descendants. So he he uh, says that he is the one who will who will work this. Uh, he's the agent of this. Um, but then Hagar says uh, she she speaks about uh, she calls the name of the Lord who spoke to her. You are the God who sees. So she claims that this was really God. Uh, and she says, Have I also seen him who sees me? Uh, so, uh, so she expresses here that that he is the Lord Himself, this angel of the Lord. Later in Genesis, uh, in chapter nineteen, verse uh, twenty-four. Uh, the text says that that's where uh, after the angels have gone to, uh, or, the, or the two men have gone to uh, to Sodom and Gomorrah. And then uh, it says, Then the Lord rained brimstone and fire on Sodom and Gomorrah from the Lord out of the heavens. So the Lord rained uh, brimstone from the Lord. Uh, Christ was one of the three men and is at the same time the Lord. So the Lord was raining this from the Lord in heaven. Uh, so there's a clear distinction here of persons in God, in God, but also a demonstration of unity in the external works of God. Uh, so this is also a proof text of this unity of the work of the Trinity 
uh, even though there is an order in how the Trinity works. Uh, the, the Trinity all, always works together. Um, then the angel of the Lord meets Hagar again in Genesis chapter 21, verse 17 to 18. And God had heard the voice of the lad. Then the angel of God called uh, to Hagar out of heaven and said to her, What ails you, Hagar? Fear not, for God has heard the voice of the lad where he is. Arise, lift up the lad and hold him with your hand, for I will make him a great nation. So God has heard the voice. Uh, and, uh, and the angel of the Lord responds to this. Uh, uh, so so uh, again we, we see that the angel of the Lord and, and God uh, is the same. Uh, the angel of the Lord refers to God as someone, uh, also re then refers to God as someone distinguished from him. So first God hears the voice and then the angel spe uh, talks to Hagar and the angel talks about God in the third person. So, uh, and then uh, again the, the angel of the Lord promises that he will make Ishmael a great nation. So the angel of the Lord is both referring to God in the third person, and he's referred to as God, and he's doing the uh, he's claiming to do the works that God is doing. Genesis chapter twenty-two, verse eleven to twelve. Here we meet the angel of the Lord again. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, "Abraham, Abraham!" So he said, "Here I am," and he said. Do not lay your hand on the lad or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. So the angel of the Lord here calls on Abraham. And then he says that Abraham fears God in the third person. Uh, and, he, uh, and the reason for this is that uh, Abraham has not withheld, withheld his son from uh, me, meaning from the angel, from the angel of the Lord. Uh, so here we have again both uh, the angel of the, the Lord, both talking about God in the third person, but also uh, referring to himself as God. Then uh, Jacob also meets this angel of the Lord. Uh, and we can see that by comparing some passages, that uh, the one he sees uh, in Bethel is really uh, the angel of the Lord, and at the same time, God. Genesis chapter 28, verse 12 to, 12 to 13 says, Then he dreamed, and behold, a ladder was set up on earth, and its top reached to heaven. And there the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac. The land on which you lie, I will give to you and your descendants. So here, it's clearly the Lord uh, who stands above this ladder. Uh, and then when uh, Jacob wakes up, he says in verse 16 to 17, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I did not know it. And he was afraid and said, How awesome is this place? This is none other than the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. So this certainly was the Lord. This was God. Uh, and then verse uh, chapter 31, verse 3, the, uh, uh, the Lord appears to Jacob again. And it says, Then the Lord said to Jacob, Return to the land of your fathers and to your family, uh, and I will be with you. Uh, and then uh, verse 11. Then the angel of God spoke to me in a dream, saying, Jacob, and I said, Here I am. And he said, Lift your eyes now and see. All the rams which sleep on the flocks are streaked, speckled, and gray spotted, for I have seen all that Laban is doing to you. I am the God of Bethel, where you anointed the pillar and where you made a vow to me. Now arise, get out of this land, and return to the land of your family. Now this is clearly the angel of God. Uh, but he was also the Lord in verse 3. And he uh, s s talks about himself as the God of Bethel, uh, where Jacob made a vow to him. So he 
uh, makes clear that, that, it, that it was him, the angel of God, who appeared to Jacob in Bethel. Um, then Genesis chapter 35, verse 1. Then God said to Jacob, Arise, go up to Bethel and dwell there, and make an altar there to God who appeared to you when you fled from the face of Esau, your brother. So here again, God speaks to Jacob and says that he was the one who appeared to Jacob. So it was both the angel of the Lord and uh, and God who appeared to uh, Jacob there. Um, then in Genesis chapter 35 verse 9, uh, God appeared again to Jacob. Um, Jacob also meets uh, God as a man in uh, Genesis chapter 32, verse 28 to 30, uh, where he meets this man at night who, uh, who he wrestles with. Uh, and he said, Your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel, and you, for you have struggled with God and with men and have prevailed. Then Jacob asked, saying, Tell me your name, I pray. And he said, Why is it that you ask my name? And he blessed him there. And Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, for I have seen God face to face, and my life is preserved. Uh, and this, we must assume, is also the angel of the Lord, because no one has seen the Father. Uh, John says in uh, in his Gospel chapter chapter one. Um, Jacob, uh, at the end of his life in Genesis uh, chapter forty eight, uh, talks about this angel uh, when he blesses Joseph. He says. God before whom my fathers Abraham and Isaac walked, the God who has fed me all my life long to this day, the angel who has redeemed me from all evil, bless the lads, that is Joseph's sons. Um, so here he has, this is a kind, almost a Trinitarian formula. It is God before whom my fathers Abraham and Isaac walked, that's one. And the God who has fed me all my life to this day, that's two. And then the angel who has redeemed me from all evil. Bless these lads. Uh, so this is almost Trinitarian. He mentions uh, uh, God three times, one of them as the angel. Um, we learn more about this angel in uh, Exodus, where we are also introduced to, uh, to a revelation of what seems to be the Holy Spirit. Um, Exodus chapter 3, verse 2 to 7. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire from the midst of a bush. So he looked, and behold, the bush was burning with fire, but the bush was not consumed. Then Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight with the bush do why the bush does not burn. So when the Lord saw that he turned aside to look, God called to him from the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses, and he said, Here I am. Then he said, Do not draw near this place. Take your sandals off your feet, for the place where you stand is holy ground. Moreover, he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. And the Lord said, I have surely seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt, and have heard their cry because of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. So here it is the angel of the Lord. And uh, and then it says that the Lord saw that he turned aside, and God called to him from the midst of the bush. Uh, so the Lord, the angel of the Lord appeared in the bush, but it's also God who calls Moses from the midst of the bush. And it is the angel of the Lord who says, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Uh, and then Moses hid his face. Uh, Let's jump down to verse 13 to 15. Then Moses said to God, Indeed, when I come to the children of Israel and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they say to me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? And God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, Thus you shall say to the children of Israel, I am has sent me to you. Moreover, God said to Moses, Thus you shall say to the children of Israel, The Lord of God, 
The Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and this is my memorial to all generations. So here he reveals himself as the one who is, the one who exists in himself. Um, and that is what the name uh, uh, Yahweh me, uh, is, is derived from, um, which is translated as the Lord uh, in the English and also in, in, in the Greek uh, as curious. Um, Exodus uh, chapter 6, verse 2 to 3, it says, And God spoke to Moses and said to him, I am the Lord. And this is the I am who I am or, uh, name. I appeared to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob as God Almighty, but by my name, Lord, I was not known to them. Now it seems here that uh, that that uh, it, it seems weird because the the word the Lord or the Yahweh is there in in uh, Genesis, but what might be going on here is that uh, in Genesis only Moses, who uh, narrates the story, identifies the angel as. Uh, Yahweh or the Lord, uh, while uh, the angel himself only identifies himself as God the Almighty. Uh, but now he shows that he is really the same as uh, Yahweh or the Lord. Uh, so this is a progression in revelation of the Trinity. Then let's jump to Exodus chapter uh, 13 uh, to 14 in uh, chapter 13 verse 21 to 22 it says and the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of cloud to lead the way and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light so as to go uh, to go by day and night he did not take away the pillar of cloud by day or the pillar of fire by night from before the people so the Lord uh, goes before them in the pillar of the cloud and, and the pillar of fire. Uh, in Exodus 14, 19, this is described further. And the angel of the Lord who went before the camp of Israel moved and went behind them, and the pillar of cloud went from before them and stood behind them. Now, is this the same? Uh, is the angel the same as the pillar of the cloud? Uh, it said in chapter 13 that the angel of the Lord is in the pillar of cloud and in the pillar of fire. I think when we uh, get to the New Testament, it becomes clear that uh, this pillar of the, the cloud and the pillar of fire, uh, just like the fire that, that uh, was in the bush, uh, the burning bush, is really uh, a revelation of the Holy Spirit. But we'll return to that. Uh, Exodus 14, 24. Now it came to pass in the morning watch that the Lord looked down upon the army of the Egyptians through the pillar of fire and cloud, and he troubled the army of the Egyptians. Uh, so the, the, the angel of the Lord, or the Lord, is in the fire and cloud, but he wasn't the fire and cloud. He saw through this fire and cloud. Uh, and then when we compare it to Acts chapter 2, uh, but also uh, transfiguration, uh, with come back to that when we talk about the New Testament, uh, I think it becomes clear that, that this presence of the Lord, or glory of the Lord, that is uh, that is seen as a fire and a cloud, is really the Holy Spirit. Um, Exodus chapter 15, uh, where the Lord is speaking about the Lord in third person. Uh, if you diligently heed the voice of the Lord your God and do what is right in his sight, give ear to his commandments and keep all his statutes, I will put none of the diseases on you which I have brought on the Egyptians, for I am the Lord who heals you. Here the Lord speaks about the Lord in the third person. And it's uh, we must assume that it's the, the second person of the Trinity who is speaking, the angel of the Lord speaking, and he speaks about, uh, hear the, about hearing the commandments of of the Father. Um, let's jump to Exodus chapter 23, where the angel is further described uh, by God. Behold, I send an angel before you to keep you in the way and to bring you into the place which I have prepared. Beware of him and obey his voice. Do not provoke him, for he will not pardon your transgressions. 
for my name is in him. But if you indeed obey his voice and do all that I speak, then I will be an enemy to your enemies and an adversary to your adversaries. For my angel will go before you and bring you into the uh, into the Amorites and Hittites and Perizzites and the Canaanites and the Hivites and the Jebusites, and I will cut them off. So here God speaks to Israel and says that he will send an angel in whom his name is. Now what is this name? Uh, we see it also in the New Testament where we are commanded to baptize in the name, not the names, but the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Uh, so this name somehow signifies the divine essence. Uh, this name, this divine essence is in the angel of the Lord. And it's something that the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit have in common. Uh, then Exodus chapter 24. Uh, then Moses went up into the mountain and a cloud covered the mountain. Now the glory of the Lord rested on Mount Sinai and the cloud covered it six days. And on the seventh day he called to Moses out of the midst of the cloud. The sight of the glory of the Lord was like consuming fire on the top of the mountain in the eyes of the children of Israel. Uh, here this glory of the Lord uh, rests on Mount Sinai uh, and covers it as a cloud and as as a, as a fire, a consuming fire, just like it had done when, when it went before them and after them as a pillar of cloud and pillar of fire. And uh, comparing this to, uh, to, to the description of transfiguration, uh, I think we can, uh, and, and, and to, uh, to the apostles in the upper room, I think uh, we can see this as the, as the Holy Spirit. Now, in, then comes the golden calf and, uh, and the sin of Israel. Uh, and God reacts to this, and we see that reaction in Exodus chapter 33, verse 1 to 2. Then the Lord said to Moses, Depart and go up here, you and the people whom you have brought out of the land of Egypt, to the land of which I swore to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, saying to your descendants, I will give. And I will send my angel before you, and, uh, and I will drive, drive out the Canaanite, and the Amorite, and the Hittite, and the Perizzite, and the Hivite, and the Jebusite. Uh, and then, this could seem like it is the same angel, the angel of the Lord, the one in whom God's name is. Uh, but Moses speaks to God in the in the fire and pillar and wants to know who this angel is. Uh, it says in verse 10 to 12, All the people saw the pillar of cloud standing at the tabernacle door, and all the people rose and worshipped, each man in his tent door. So the Lord spake to Mo spoke to Moses face to face as a man speaks to his friend. And he would return to the camp, but his servant Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man, did not depart from the tabernacle. Then Moses said to the Lord, See you, uh, see you say to me, Bring up this people, but you have not let me know whom you will send with me. Yet you have said, I know you by name, and you have also found grace in my sight. Um, and it's, this is weird if this is the same angel. So this seems like this is really another angel, what we today call an angel uh, of God, that he will send instead of the angel in whom uh, his name is. Um, so it is a created angel and not the uncreated uh, angel of the Lord that he will send. Uh, God answers the prayer and he uh, he says that his presence or face will go with Israel. And he said, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. And this presence is possibly both the, the pillar and the cloud, but also the angel of the Lord was in it. So it's possibly both the Son and the Holy Spirit that is called the presence or the face of the Lord. Um, and then uh, in the same chapter, um, Moses sees God from behind 
And he said, Please show me your glory. Then he said, I will make all my goodness pass before you, and I will proclaim the name of the Lord before you. I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. But he said, You cannot see my face, for no man shall see me and live. And the Lord said, Here is a place by me, and you shall stand on the rock. So it shall be, while my glory passes by, that I will put you in the cleft of the rock, and I will cover you with my hand while I pass by. Then I will take away my hand, and you shall see my back, but my face shall not be seen. Uh, and exactly how to understand this face is, is not certain. Uh, but what is certain here is the, that the Lord shows something of himself, his hand, uh, and, and, and uh, puts this hand uh, between his glory or his face and Moses. Uh, so possibly this is the father who uh, is then... Uh, covered uh, with the with the sun as his hand, and and Moses sees the, his back, which might be the spirit or, or the sun. Uh, at least this this uh, the, the the Lord shows something of himself, but not his face, and and uh, but and and he hides that by another part of 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 God, uh, or not a part, but another uh, another person of 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 God. <clears throat> and when we compare this to to John chapter one, we can see that this is that this is the Father, uh, because no one has seen the Father. Is what John says there. Uh, <clears throat> then in uh, Numbers uh, chapter um, six, verse twenty four to twenty six. We have the the Aaronic, Aaronic blessing, uh, which says, "The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord makes His face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift His countenance upon you and give you peace." So we have someone just called the Lord, and then we have two called uh, the the face of the Lord, uh, and we change it in in the English. We do that in, in the Danish too, so that it doesn't sound the same in verse twenty five and twenty six. But it's really the same. Face, it's it's the face of the Lord. So there are two faces of the Lord, and then there is the Lord here, uh, and uh, and this is a trinitarian blessing, uh, like the one Jacob made, uh, and uh, but but here two faces are are, are named here, and uh, that's the Spirit and the Son. We must assume. In Numbers chapter twelve, there's revelation again of God. Uh, then he said, Hear now my words, if there is a prophet among you, I, the Lord, make myself known to him in a vision. Here we know, from this we know that the, the, the angel or the word of the Lord who shows himself is really the Lord. I speak to him in a dream, not so with my servant Moses. He is faithful in all my house. I speak with him face to face, even plainly, and not in dark sayings. And he sees the form of the Lord. Why then were you not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? So Moses has seen the form of God, of the Lord. But we just learned uh, from, from Exodus chapter uh, 33 that he has not seen the face of God, but he has seen the form of God. And this form of God, when compared to the New Testament, we can assume that that is the Son who is called the image of the invisible God in Colossians 1.15 um, and something similar in, in Hebrews. Um In uh, Deuteronomy chapter 5, we learn that God is nevertheless one. You shall have no other gods before me. Uh, it says in Deuteronomy 5, 7. Or in the Septuagint, thou shalt have no other gods before my face. Uh, and the face might be, be the Son and the Holy Spirit here. Uh, so we are commanded not to have other gods than uh, the Lord. So we know here that he's one Lord, even though he's three persons. Then in chapter 6, verse 4, we have the Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Uh, so God is one, even though he has revealed himself as both the angel or the word, and, uh, and as the presence uh, or the face of the Lord. Uh, in, in the in the cloud and the fire. 
uh, and also here there is a threefold mention of mentioning of God. It says the Lord, our God, the Lord is one. Uh, so this both expresses a trinity uh, and the unity of God. Yeah. Then we come to uh, Joshua, Judges, and Samuel. Uh, Joshua meets this angel of the Lord uh, again, um, and he does that outside Jericho. And it came to pass when Joshua was by Jericho that he lifted his eyes and looked, and behold, a man stood opposite him with his sword drawn in his hand. And Joshua went to him and said to him, are you for us or for our adversaries? So he said, No, but as, as commander of the army of the Lord, I have now come. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and worshipped and said to him, What does my Lord say to his servant? Then the commander of the Lord's army said to Joshua, Take your sandal off your foot, for the place where you stand is holy. holy. And Joshua did so. And uh, when we compare this to the, the the burning bush, it's clear what is uh, what is happening here and who he, who he meets. He worships him, and he's also commanded to take off his sandals from his foot. So this man, who is the commander of the army uh, of the Lord, is the the angel of the Lord. And later in uh, in uh, Numbers, or uh, earlier Numbers uh, twenty two. Verse 22 to 23, uh, the angel of the Lord is also seen with a drawn sword, as he is later in First Chronicles uh, chapter 21, to, uh, verse 11 to 16. So that the angel of the Lord shows himself with, with a drawn sword is something that happens other places in Scripture too. Then uh, we uh, go to Judges, uh, chapter 2, verse 1 to 5. Then the angel of the Lord came up from Gilgal to book him and said, I led you up from Egypt and brought you to the land of which I swore to your fathers and said, I will never break my covenant with you. And you shall make no covenant with the inhabitants of this land and you shall tear down their altars. But you have not obeyed my voice. Why have you done this? Therefore I also said, I will not drive them out before you, but they shall be thorns in your side and their guards shall be a snare to you. So it was when the angel of the Lord spoke these words to all the children of Israel that the people lifted up their voice and, and wept. Then they called the name at that place Bochim, and they sacrificed there to the Lord. Um, and so the angel here speaks to Israel and said that, that he led them up from Egypt. Uh, and he uh, says that they have not obeyed his voice. That's what they were commanded to obey. Uh, when God spoke to Moses. Um, um, so later in Judges, he appears to Gideon. Uh, Judges uh, chapter 6, verse 11 to 14. Now the angel of the Lord came and sat under the terebinth tree, which was in opera, which belonged to Joas the Abbasrite. Abba while his son Gideon threshed wheat in the winepress in order to hide it from the Midianites. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said to him, The Lord is with you, you mighty man of valor. Gideon said to him, O my Lord, if the Lord is with us, why then has all this happened to us? And where are all his miracles which our fathers told us about, saying, Did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord has forsaken us and delivered us into the hands of the Midianites. Then the Lord turned to him and said, Go in this might of yours, and you shall save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Have I not sent you? So here we have again, first, that he is called the angel of the Lord, and then that Gideon calls him my Lord, and then it says that the Lord turned to him. So again we have this uh, seemingly, con seemingly confusion of the angel of the Lord and the Lord, but it's not a confusion, it's because the angel of the Lord is the Lord. Again in uh, verse 21 to 22, Then the angel of the Lord put out the end of the staff that was in his hand, and touched the meat and the unleavened bread, and fire rose out of the rock, and consumed the meat and the unleavened bread. And the angel of the Lord departed out of his sight. Now Gideon perceived that he was the angel of the Lord. 
Saul Gideon said, Alas, O Lord God, for I have seen the angel of the Lord face to face. Um, so he sees here that it is the angel of the Lord, and then he is uh, struck by fear because he has seen the angel of the Lord. Uh, um, and this is much like those who react the same way when they have seen the Lord. And we see that uh, later in Judges uh, chapter 13, where the angel appears to Manoah, uh, the father of uh, of uh, um, Samson. Yeah. Uh, verse 3, And the angel of the Lord appeared to the woman and said to her, Indeed, now you are barren and have borne no children, but you shall conceive and bear a son. Then Manoah said to the angel of the Lord, What is your name, that, that when your words come to pass we may honor you? And the angel of the Lord said to him, Why do you ask my name, seeing it is wonderful? Uh, and we can think about uh, I say at uh, chapter nine verse six, where the Lord is called uh, wonderful counselor, or the, the child that is to be born is called wonderful counselor. Then verse twenty one, when the angel of the Lord appeared no more to Manuel and his wife, then Manuel knew that he was the angel of the Lord, and Manuel said to his wife, "We shall surely die because we have seen God." So here Manuel identifies the angel of the Lord as God. Now the angel of the Lord didn't show himself uh, a lot in uh, throughout Judges uh, because Israel had sinned, uh, and therefore First uh, Samuel chapter three verse one says, "And the word of the Lord was rare in those days; there was no widespread revelations." Uh, and this is not just talking about uh, that God has not spoken very much in those days, but that the word of the Lord uh, did not appear in visions a lot in those days. So it's talking about the Son of God. Um, later in verse 7, it says, Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord, nor was the word of the Lord yet revealed to him. Uh, so that means that he had not yet seen the word, that is the Son of God, the angel of the Lord. Verse 10, Now the Lord came and stood and called, as at other times, Samuel, Samuel, and Samuel answered, Speak for your servant, hears. The word appears visibly here. Uh, uh, because he stood and called, as at the other times. Then verse 15, So Samuel lay down until morning and opened the doors of the house of the Lord, and Samuel was afraid to tell Eli the vision. So here we know that it was a vision he saw. He saw the word of the Lord in a vision, just like it had been uh, said by to Moses that uh, the Israelite, that the prophets would, and as he had appeared to Abraham uh, as the word of the Lord in a vision. Um, then, in verse 21, Then the Lord appeared again in Shiloh, for the Lord revealed himself to Samuel in Shiloh by the word of the Lord. Uh, so here it says that it was the Lord, uh, and uh, then again that it was that he revealed himself by the word of the Lord. So the Lord reveals himself by the word of the Lord. The Son of God is the one through whom the Trinity reveals himself to Samuel. Um, this word of the Lord is also spoken about in Psalm 33, verse 6. By the word of the Lord the heavens were made, and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. Uh, now this breath uh, is the same word as, as, as the one that, that means spirit. So uh, this is talking about how God made everything by the word and by the spirit. Uh, Psalm 2 verse 11 to 12 speaks about the son. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son lest he be angry and you perish in the way. When his wrath is kindled but a little. Blessed are all those who put their trust in him. So the son uh, is the one that we are to kiss or put our trust in. 
Then Psalm 110 says, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand, till I make your enemies your footstool. <coughs> Here the Lord talks to the Lord. And uh, 2 Samuel 23, verse 2 to 3, is also talking about uh, David. The Spirit of the Lord spoke by me, and his word was on my tongue. The God of Israel said, The rock of Israel spoke to me. He who rules over men must be just, ruling in the fear of God. Um, <clears throat> here, uh, David mentions the Spirit of the Lord, and the God of Israel, and the Rock of Israel. And we might understand the Rock of Israel as the Son uh, of God. But he has this threefold mentioning of God, and one of them explicitly the Spirit. Solomon um, sees the glory of God in the temple, as it was seen in the tabernacle, in uh, 1 Kings 8, 10 to 11. And it came to pass, when the priest came out of the holy place, that the cloud filled the house of the Lord, so that the priest could not continue ministering because of the cloud, for the glory of the Lord filled the house of the Lord. Uh, so this cloud, which was the the, the glory of, uh, of, of the Lord, uh, which was also seen in, uh, in, in Exodus, filled the house of the Lord. Uh, and in the New Testament, we will see that this cloud is probably the Holy Spirit. <coughs> Elijah sees God too. Uh, In uh, 1 Kings 19, 9-13, <clears throat> uh, it says, And there he went into a cave and spent the night in that place, and behold, the word of the Lord came to him. So the word of the Lord came to him and said to him, The word of the Lord is talking. What are you doing here, Elijah? So he said, I have been very zealous for the Lord, of, Lord God of hosts, for the children of Israel have forsaken your covenant, torn down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left, and they seek to take my life. Then he said, Go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by, and a great and strong wind tore into the mountains and broke the rocks in pieces before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind, and after the wind an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire, and after the fire a still small voice. So it was when Elijah heard it that he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood in the entrance of the cave. Suddenly a voice came to him and said, What are you doing here, Elijah? So first the, the, the word of the Lord speaks to Elijah and he shows himself to Elijah and then Elijah afterwards uh, sees God uh, or hears God in this wind uh, talking to him. Uh, possibly the father talking like Possibly it was the father talking on Sinai, uh, like the father was talking at the baptism of Jesus and uh, and on transfiguration. <coughs> then Isaiah talks about uh, about uh, Isaiah seeing the Lord. I saw the Lord sitting on a throne high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple, in Isaiah 6.1. So he saw the Lord, but we know from the New Testament that no one has seen the Father, uh, and the, the, the Word, uh, or the Son, has become, has, is the one who reveals him. Um, but Isaiah saw the Lord here. Then in verse 3, it says, And one cried to another, uh, and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of the host. The whole earth is full of his glory. Uh, and here's a threefold holy, uh, which is also something that points to the Trinity. Then verse, verse uh, 8. Also, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Then I said, Here I am, send me. So here, uh, the voice of the Lord is speaking in the plural about himself, who will go for us. Uh, again, a revelation of the Trinity. Isaiah uh, chapter 9 talks about 
the Messiah, for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder. And his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. So at least Mighty God and Everlasting Father are uh, divine titles given to the Messiah. And then Isaiah says in uh, 61 verse 1, uh, about, about the Messiah again, uh, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, that's the Messiah speaking, because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim the liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to those who are bound. So he is talking, the Messiah is talking here as the one on whom the Spirit of the Lord is. Um, <clears throat> then uh, we meet in uh, Isaiah 63, we meet both the angel of the Lord and uh, and the Holy Spirit. Uh, in all their affliction he was afflicted, and the angel of his presence saved them. In his love and in his pity he redeemed them, and he bore them and carried them all the days of old. But they rebelled and grieved his Holy Spirit, so he turned himself against them as an enemy, and he fought against them. He will see that, that the angel had helped them, but also that they grieved his Holy Spirit. Uh, so the Holy Spirit is ju isn't just a force, it's someone who can be grieved. Uh, then he remembered the days of old, Moses and his people saying, uh, Where is he who brought them up uh, out of the sea with the shepherd of his flock? Where is he who put his Holy Spirit within them? Um, or among or in the midst of them. So here we learn that the Holy Spirit is a person and uh, the angel has helped them. But we also learn that the Spirit was in their midst in the, des in the desert. Uh, and again, looking at Acts chapter 2, where he s reveals himself uh, as a fire, and uh, possibly transfiguration also uh, as a cloud. Uh, we can we can compare these, and and it seems that this cloud of pillar of fire that followed them and was in their midst in in the desert is really the the Holy Spirit. Um, then Jeremiah uh, it, in uh, when, when he's called in chapter 1 verse 4 to 9 it says then the word of the Lord came to me saying before I formed you in the womb I knew you before you were born I sanctified you I ordained you a, a prophet to the nations uh, then said I our Lord God behold I cannot speak for I am a youth but the Lord said to me do not say I am a youth for you shall go and shall go to all to whom I sent you, and whatever I command you, you shall speak. Do not be afraid of their faces, for I am with you to deliver you, says the Lord. Then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth, and the Lord said to me, Behold, I have put my words in your mouth. So here again it says that the word of the Lord came and spoke. And then this uh, word of the Lord is called the Lord. And finally it says that the Lord put forth his hand and touched uh, the mouth of Jeremiah. Now, one, no one has seen the Father, uh, so so this Lord is the Word of the Lord. It is the Angel of the Lord who did this. Um, so, we could take other examples, but uh, I think this is enough to prove uh, this gradual, progressive revelation of of uh, of the Trinity in the Old Testament. Um, in conclusion, I'll quote. Uh, Carl Beckwith in his uh, work on the Holy uh, Trinity uh, Christ appeared to Abraham bringing him great joy Isaiah saw his glory and spoke of him uh, John chapter 12 verse 41 Jesus led the people out of Egypt Jude chap chapter 5 this is all New Testament verses talking about the Old Testament Christ was with Israel in the wilderness 1 Corinthians 10 uh, 1 to 10. The Son is the image of the invisible God, Colossians 1 15, who is at the Father's side and who has made the unseen Father known to us, John 1 18. To look upon the Son is to see the Father, John 
14:9-11. Who is the Yahweh seen in, seen in the Old Testament making known the unseen Yahweh? The New Testament never hesitates to make this identification. And this is especially the Son, but we can also uh, say some of the same things about the Spirit who reveals himself in the cloud and the pillar of fire. Um, now this Trinitarian reading of the Old Testament was not uh, completely unknown to the Jews. Uh, the philosopher Philo uh, spoke about uh, this uh, in his work on confusion of tongues. He says, And even if there be not as yet anyone who is worthy to be called a son of God, nevertheless let him labor earnestly to be adorned according to his firstborn Logos, that's the word, the eldest of his angels, as the great archangel of many names. For he is called the authority and the name of God and the word, and man according to God's image, and he who sees Israel. Even if we are not yet suitable to be called the sons of God, still we may deserve to be called the children of his eternal image, of his most sacred logos. That means the word, the Greek word for word. word. For the image of God is his most ancient word, the logos. Uh, so Philo, who lived uh, before Christ, around the time of Christ, he, uh, he, um, he describes this logos as the great archangel as the image of the Lord uh, and as the son of God, the firstborn. And uh, again, uh, in the work on, on changing of names, a kind of these two is the creative power called God, because through this the Father, who is its begetter and contriver, made the universe, so that I am thy God is equivalent to I am thy maker and artificer. And the greatest gift we can have is to have him for our architect, who was also the architect of the whole world. And therefore we read, let us make man after our image, Genesis 1, 26. So that according as the wax received the bad or the noble impress, it should appear to be the handiwork of others or of him who is the frame of the noble and the good alone. So he speaks here uh, about uh, about this creative power called God, who is who through whom God creates everything. And finally, uh, when talking about the Old Testament, uh, we'll mention that uh, the Targum uh, also speaks about uh, this word of the Lord. And uh, I'll quote a secondary source here. Uh, Van Dorn, Douglas Van Dorn, uh, The Angel of the Lord, A Biblical, Historical and Theological Study, page 245. Uh, it speaks about the Targum. Memra is used in a very strange way. As one scholar, Abelson, put it uh, a century ago, these Jews were sufficiently advanced to find difficulty in the more startlingly anthropomorphic expressions of the Old Testament like the Lord God walked in the garden. Wherever anything of this kind occurs in the original, the Tarkum replaces it by some inoffensive substitute. The dwelling of the Lord, uh, Shekinta or Shekina, or the word of the Lord, the Memra, are the most common. Um, so uh, the Jews uh, who uh, translated the Bible into Aramaic or, or paraphrased it in Aramaic, they would substitute Whenever God uh, is is uh, is showing Himself in an anthropomorphic way in the Old Testament, they were translated as as the dwelling of the Lord, or the presence of the Lord, uh, or the word of the Lord, the Memra, uh, the Aramaic word of uh, called the word. So they knew that there was this word of the Lord, who is also a person and the Lord Himself. Now I think we'll take a break here and uh, continue. Uh, with the New Testament and and a more systematic presentation uh, in in uh, in a second lecture. Um.